He's us in Christ. What Christ is, I am. And I'm supposed to live that way. See? I have... Christ is no more subject to sin. Is he? Christ is seated in heaven. Could Christ sin today? No. For that reason, you and I ought not to sin because we are in Christ. That's the basis of our salvation. Sinning is contradictory to our life in Christ. And in fact, for the first time in the book of Romans, in verses 11 to 13, we have imperatives. He tells us, do this and don't do that for the first time. And it's very significant. Christians, it's a serious matter to take the grace of God for granted and to, to look in a little and a light way on our sin. Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God. Do not let sin reign in your body. Don't yield your members instruments of sin to unrighteousness. See what he tells us to do? Don't do that. Now, in the latter half of chapter 6, he gives us a different reason why we should not sin. Why we should look at sin in a little way. Basically, the reason is very, is, well, is this. That when we sin, we become a slave to sin. When you do one sin, it's easier to do another sin. And another sin. And pretty soon it's a lifestyle and you don't look any different than any other unsaved person. See? And the word servant occurs over and over and over in verses 60, 15 to 23. And you just want to, might want to circle that because that's the point. When you sin, you're becoming a slave to something that is contrary to the nature that you have in you. You become a slave to sin and the results of sin is death and God doesn't want Christians to live that way. In fact, he's given us life. He's delivered us from death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, on the other hand. Now, why not live a servant to righteousness on the opposite? See? We should not be servants to sin, but servants to that which is righteous. Now, in chapter 7, there's another problem. Some Christians feel like they... They've got to do it. They have to live the Christian life. It's all up to them. And they're forgetting a principle that was done away with by Christ. What Paul is teaching us in chapter 7 is that, number one, in the first six verses, the law system and the law principle has been removed, been wiped out, as far as our experience is concerned. We're not subject to trying to please God by keeping all of God's commandments. We don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. We can't please God by keeping the Ten Commandments because we can't keep the Ten Commandments. God knows it's impossible for us to keep the Ten Commandments. See? And every time we fail, we displease God. So that's not the way we please God. We don't try to please God by keeping a bunch of commandments. That kind of a system is passed off the scene. In fact, another reason why we can't do it that way is because of the nature of our bodies. The word flesh is a key word in verses 7 to the end of chapter 7. It occurs over and over and over and over. Paul gives his own testimony. Key word is I, ego, all right, myself. I try to do this. What I want to do, I can't do, Paul says. See? Uh, I know what is wrong, but I end up doing it anyway. See? Now, the reason that we can't please God by trying to keep His commandments, trying to look at the Christian life as a bunch of do's and don'ts, that's the wrong way to look at the Christian life. Because we can't live it that way anyway. So don't try. All right? Our flesh defeats us at every turn. That's, in essence... By the way, why God gave the commandments in the first place. It says in the book of Galatians, and it says about four times in the book of Romans here, that the reason that the law existed in the first place was to show people their sinfulness. Look at chapter 7 and verse... Uh, 
13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. See? God's word just shows us what is right and what's wrong. See? And we can't, we shouldn't look at the Christian life as a bunch of do's and don'ts because, well, we can't do it even when we want to do it. And so the question that Paul comes down to in his experience that more and more Christians come down to every day is, oh, wretched person that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? See? Chapter 7, verse 24. I'm a miserable person. I'm trying to live the Christian life. I can't live the Christian life. What's wrong? I'd like to forget it. Who's going to deliver me? Let me out of this cage. You know? And notice that Paul is now leading us into the answer. Because the question has been phrased, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul knows that he couldn't. You and I know that we can't live the Christian life ourselves. The answer has to be someone other than ourselves. And that's what Romans chapter 8 is all about. The Trinity... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is filled in their relationships with one another in Romans chapter 8. We find, first of all, in the first 13 verses, that Jesus and the Holy Spirit combine in their works for us to give us victory over our flesh. See, Jesus came in His flesh and did away with the power of sin. And when he did that, then he gave us the spirit of life. The spirit of life dwells in our bodies, it says right there in verse uh, 9 and verse 2. We're under a new law now, a new system, a, a system that is the, a law of life, the spirit of life, not death, see? Now, this is something that we have to believe. We have to reckon it. In fact, that's what he comes down to. He says... Um, Verse 12 and 13, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. But if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. It comes down to a choice that we have to make. We have to realize that there's two ways to approach our problems as Christians. We can either try to do it ourselves, or we can get our eyes off ourselves, off other Christians, and so forth. And we can look at what Jesus has done for us. Now, as soon as we take our eyes off ourselves and get our eyes on the Lord, we're going to start having victory. That's a promise from God's Word. Now, you won't experience it until you try it. See? The Christian life is a life of faith. We believe God, what He says. And He says that the righteousness of the law is possible to be fulfilled in us. When... When we get our eyes off ourselves and onto the Lord, that's called walking after the Spirit. And walking after the Spirit is as simple as getting our eyes off ourselves, believing what Jesus has done for me, and waiting to see it work. You know, believing that God is going to do it. And that affects our minds, verses 5, 6, and 7. It affects my body, verses 8, 9, and 10, and so forth. Right? It just affects my whole person. Verses 14 through 27, the Father and the Holy Spirit, called the Spirit of Adoption, combine in their relationships to one another to provide victory for us over suffering. Christians who suffer need to realize that it's all under God's control, that there's an end to it, that God the Holy Spirit is in God's presence praying for us. We have to believe that God can give us the help for that. See? Verses 28 to the end of the chapter, or, yeah, 28 to the end of the chapter, we have the relationship between the Father and the Son. And that the Father has a plan. And that plan includes the Son. And that Christians are brought into God's plan to be made like Jesus. And God is never going to do anything evil against His Son. Why should he do anything evil against us? There is nothing that's going to separate me from the love of Christ, Paul concludes. See? So, chapter 8 in Romans, then, is our solution. 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have combined in making promises to us, and they work together in us and through us and for us so that we can have victory over ourselves, our flesh, over circumstances in suffering, over anything. And you'll notice in verses 28 to 39, the word thing occurs maybe a dozen times. Anything, all things, are included in this provision. I guess we're going to have to... We got halfway through. <laughs> we got eight more chapters to go. We'll pick up with this next Sunday. And in the meantime, if you have questions, please come and share them with me. And... Uh, We'll spend some time together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this so great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. We acknowledge before you readily, Lord, that we are sinners. We acknowledge that your standards are perfect and unattainable in our own measures and frail abilities father we cannot do what we would like to do even and our father we thank you that you have provided a life that is abundant a life that where in which it is possible to live above our problems in which the circumstances and difficulties of life have no power over us when we trust you we pray that you would drive the truth of your word home to every heart this morning Particularly, Lord, if there is someone here that recognizes that they are a sinner, recognizes that you are perfect and holy and righteous, and that you demand holiness from all men, and that they stand under your judgment because they have not accepted what Jesus has done. We pray that you would cause that person to place their confidence in the work of Christ, believing that what you have said so it is and it will be in the future and that in the meantime we're saved by faith and by your grace help us to live as we ought this week and to appropriate the truths of your word in jesus name amen the next major point that paul is discussing in the, in this letter to the roman christians is in chapters 9 through 11. Three chapters devoted to something that's very important. Paul is now kind of stopped. He's finished his discussion of salvation, what salvation means to us all, why we need it. And he's backtracks in time and relates Christianity to history, to God's plan and program in other times. It's important for us to see this. Because Christianity isn't something that just started with the person in the 19th century. It didn't start in the 16th century or the 2nd century even. It started in the 1st century. But it is uniquely related to all that God has done in the past. And it's important that Christians see this. This is one of the best ways to identify cults today. False religions. Find out where they started, when they started, by what leader they started. And you can very often tell the falsehood. Now, Christianity isn't a cult. Christianity fits in the plan and the program of God. And in chapter 9, 10 and 11, Paul endeavors to show how it fits. Now remember, in the, in the day and time in which Paul was writing, he was writing to Jewish Christians. You know, the majority of people that were Christians in his time had a Jewish background. Uh, remember, Paul was in uh, Greece, right? That's very close to Palestine, and he was writing to uh, Italy, to Rome. And Paul had come from Palestine. And people were all enmeshed in, in Jewish history at this point in time. Now, when Paul was alive... Jewish people were very, very sensitive to any suggestion that God would bless a Gentile, someone who was a non-Jew. 
This is only natural because as Paul shows us in the first half of chapter 9, he shows that the nation Israel was a chosen nation. Remember Abraham? God chose Abraham and said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you, you know, an uncountable number of children. And this is going to be a special nation. And Paul lists the blessings of this nation in verses 4 and 5. The Israelites uh, were adopted by God. They had God's glory and the covenants with God. God gave the Jews a law. The Jews had a service whereby they could worship God and God would be pleased. Uh, God gave the Jewish people and the Jewish people alone promises. And there are many, many other things. All right? The Jewish people were specially blessed. Now, in the first, in chapter 9, Paul is reconciling the, ma the, the idea that God would bless people who weren't Jews just like he, he blessed people who were Jews. That's important for him point for him to start. It's a starting point. In other words. And so that's in essence what he does. He is in chapter 9. First of all, he establishes for the readers that the Jews were specially blessed. Amen, brother. Preach it, Paul. All right. They would have gone along with him. But Paul was laying a very special foundation. Not only were the Jewish, was the Jewish nation specially chosen of God, of all the nations of earth, but there were only certain people, Paul said, that were chosen by God in the nation. God chose Abraham. He didn't choose everybody. There were lots of Jews that were unrighteous. Just because they were a Jew didn't mean they were saved. Right? They had to put trust in God's promises like Abraham. Right? And Paul gives two examples. He uses the example of Isaac that was chosen by God and the example of uh, Jacob. Right? Two individuals in Jewish history that were chosen by God. Now, Paul is laying a very important basis here. Number one, he showed that the Jewish nation was specially blessed and chosen. Secondly, he shows that only certain individuals of the Jewish nation had a proper relationship with God. Esau rejected God, you see. Ishmael rejected God, right? Lots of Jews rejected God. Now, the next logical and most important step that Paul takes us to is verses 22 to 24 in chapter 9. And he shows to the Jews that it's not unreasonable for God to bless, to choose to bless those who were non-Jews because it's still up to God to do what he wants just like he did in the first place. God didn't have to bless only Jews. God didn't have to choose only some individuals. God can do what he wishes. He can save everybody if he wants to. He hasn't chosen to. But he has chosen to bless those who will believe. Let's read verses 22 to 24. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had before prepared unto glory even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only but also of the Gentiles there are the key verses to chapter 9 he finally reached the point Paul has said listen God isn't just dealing with the Jewish people as he has for the last 4,000 years. Today, and that's in the first century, and God has continued his program into 1980. Today, God is offering salvation to everybody, to Gentiles, to people who aren't just Jews. So you see, Christianity is to, is to Judaism, to the Jewish history and religion what a flower is to a bud you know we are very closely related in our plan and relationship to God as the Jews were it's the same God and God deals the same way with us if we trust what he says and this is what Paul is telling us here Christianity isn't just a horse of a different color it doesn't it's not a, a breakdown of God's plan and program you Jewish people it's just an extension of it in chapter 10 Romans chapter 10, <coughs> Paul compares the way the Jews believed 
Jewish self-righteousness to faith righteousness that God expects from everybody. Now one reason that's involved why God doesn't just work with the Jewish nation alone today in 1980 like he did before Christ was that the Jewish nation rejected Christ. They tried to do it their own way. And people today are still doing the same thing. They're still trying to be right with God by forgetting what God has said and just doing what they think. Well, if I'm a good enough person, if I go to church, if I never kill anybody, if I just raise my kids right, if I'm a good citizen and so forth goes the list, well, God won't shut the pearly gates on me. See? Romans chapter 10 is showing us Paul is showing that the reason, one of the reasons that God is not just dealing with Israel today is because they have disobeyed what he said. They, they tried to do it their own way. Let's read the first five verses and see that. And I think these are the key verses to this chapter. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man who doeth those things shall live by them. You'll notice the next word is but. But the righteousness which is of faith. Paul is contrasting the attempted self-righteousness that the Jewish nation and the people in the nation had to the righteousness that God blesses. And that is the righteousness that comes by faith. Today there's only one way, as there has always been, only one way to please God. And that is to, tr to put confidence in the words of God the promises of God. You see? Abraham believed the promise of God and God counted it to him for righteousness. That happened 5,000 years ago. Today, the promise is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved. See? It's the same way. Righteousness comes by belief, by faith. And the Jewish people they couldn't see that. That's why they put Christ on the cross. That's why the Jewish people and most of the people that did that were religious leaders. They were the well-known religious people in Jesus' day. They rejected Jesus Christ. They hated Him. And they killed Him. And they tried to do it their own way. You know, this, this is a parallel description to what the cults are doing today. The cults today are rejecting the work of Christ and saying, do it this way. You know, if you'll sell your house, your property, your car, and give all your money to so-and-so and join our little clan and live in one family and have love and brotherhood and peace, then you're going to have made. You know, that's life. See? The Jewish people did the same thing. They were ignorant of the way God did things. They rejected the fact that Christ fulfilled everything that was necessary. All we got to do is believe in him. So without going into too much more detail, this is a, in essence a summary of what the Jews were like. Right? God is no longer dealing with them as a nation in the, in the present because they rejected him. They didn't have the right kind of faith. Right? They tried to do it by works. <clears throat> we have a description of faith righteousness in verses 8 through 13. And perhaps we should read a couple of the, these verses because it shows us very clearly the difference between trying to do things right ourselves and trying to please God by what I'm doing and what God expects of us. Verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's a heart matter. 
If you want to be right with God, you've got to have a right heart. You've got to believe in your heart. You've got to put your confidence, your trust in what Christ has done. And then if you're a Christian, it's going to show. You're going to talk about it. See? It's going to change your life. You're going to confess it with your life and with your mouth. And that's what true faith righteousness is. This morning, if you're here and you've never thought that Jesus Christ was that important to you as a person, you got some something to change. you got to realize that if you don't receive what Christ has done for you, you haven't got it at all. God is going to judge you. It says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's word says, this is the way it is. And when I know that, I believe what it says. And God <coughs> saves me. That's how it works. That's the kind of faith righteousness that we have. Paul continues one further step in chapter 11. And this is probably the harshest step. This is why he put it last, I believe. To the Jewish person, they might be able to swallow that God is working with Gentiles today, you know, and not just Jews. And they might be able to see that the Jewish people really made a mistake when they put Christ on the cross. But to believe that God is going to bless Gentiles in the present and the future and judge the Jews in the future, that's, a little, that's going a little too far. See? And yet that's precisely what Paul describes in chapter 11. He describes, in essence, a bunch of prophecies. He explains what God is doing today and what he's going to do in the future. He explains that God has, for the moment in the present, set aside his blessing on the Jewish nation and is today, at the present time, blessing all the world, the Gentiles. But that's not enough. God has a plan and a program in the future. In the future, God is going to bless all the world even more. He's going to bless the Jewish nation, but first he's going to judge them. And in chapter 11, I want to draw your attention to a, a twofold division of this chapter for your own for personal study. In the first 10 verses, we have a question and answer. The question is, has God cast away his people? The first verse. Has God thrown away the Jewish people and forgot them? No, God has a chosen few. He has a remnant. He has a, a certain small group of Jewish people who have placed trust in Christ, like Paul did, you see, and like every other Jew who believes in, in Christ. There's lots of them in the New Testament, right? The, these are people with whom God is working today. I know, I know of Jewish people who are Christians today, but they're far and few between as far as the whole group is concerned. You know, most Jews, if you go to Palestine, in fact, you go to Israel today and you're allowed to be thrown in jail and fined $5,000 for witnessing to Jesus Christ. See, the Jewish nation doesn't want to have anything to do with Christ. Right? But some people believe. And that's how, what Paul is describing there in the first 10 verses, that there are some Jews who believe. God hasn't thrown them all away because he has promised to bless the Jews, see. And if he didn't bless any Jews, then he would be breaking his promise. Now, in chapter, verse 11, through the end of the chapter, we have the second major division. And that is something else that starts with a question and answer. The question is, in verse 11, have they stumbled that they should fall? Or literally, the, the Greek states, have they stumbled for the purpose that they should fall? In other words, this is a question now of God's purpose. What is God's purpose for the people? Why did he allow the Jewish people to reject Jesus Christ in the first place? Well, Paul develops his argument and shows that God has a reason for it. That there's a plan in progress today. And we're living right smack dab in the middle of it. Of God's plan. Things aren't just happening by happenstance. God has a plan. The reason God allowed the Jewish nation to reject Jesus Christ was so that he could extend salvation to all the world. See, if Jesus had never died on the cross, there wouldn't be such a thing as salvation by faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, would there be? Right? You couldn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus if he hadn't died. See? 
So God had a purpose in allowing the Jews to reject Christ. So that all the world could be saved. That's basically it. You read that in verse 11 and 12. God forbid, but rather through their fall, the fall of the nation, salvation has come unto the Gentiles to provoke them, the Jews, to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them, the Jews, be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. In other words, Paul says, it's, all, it's not all a negative purpose. God hasn't just looked at his people with hate, and judgments and throwing them out of his plan and program but there is yet a hope for them there is yet a future and he describes that in the following verses we won't dwell on that but you'll find maybe we should just read one verse to two verses to show that in verses 24 and 25 and 26 three verses we find the future of Israel if in verse 24 for if you were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and were engrafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree how much more shall these the Jewish people who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree for I would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. All right, now I know it's some difficulties there to understand. But the point that Paul is making is that the Jewish people have been judged by God so that all the world could be saved to make it possible. And yet there's a future. And this is a mystery. The prophets couldn't understand why the Messiah, who was supposed to be the king of the Jewish nation, was to be killed. That didn't make sense because he was supposed to reign for a thousand years and forever and ever. See? How could the Jews' king be killed if he was going to reign forever and ever. They couldn't understand that. Peter tells us they searched diligently. They couldn't understand those things. Okay. It's a mystery. Paul tells us in verse 25, it's a mystery. We need to understand it. This is important stuff, Christians. We need to see that Christianity today is the outworking of a, per, a plan of God that wasn't revealed before Christ's time. God is presently judging the nation so all the world can be saved. But God has a future program for both the world and the nation. The nation is going to be saved and blessed. And so is the world. The world is going to be blessed as well. So in conclusion then, in this section, we find that Paul takes the Jews from step A to B to C. You know, He shows them that the Gentiles are blessed of God just like they were blessed. Secondly, that the reason for it is because the Jews haven't got the right kind of faith. They're trying to do it themselves. And therefore, God has judged them. The third point is that even though God has presently judged the nation, Israel today, there is a future program and plan for them. In the meantime, God is blessing the whole world through faith. All right? Now, there's a lot of stuff in those chapters, and I know you've got questions, but we'll have to leave it at there. With this word, there are three characteristics of God that come out in chapters 9, 10, and 11. In chapter 9, we have a sovereign God who chooses men and nations and people as he wills. In chapter 10, we have a long-suffering God. He has put up with the nation for years. And today he's putting up with you if you haven't trusted in Christ. He's a long-suffering God. He's not willing that any should perish. He's waiting for you to trust in Christ. In chapter 11, we find that he's a wise God. Who else could think of a plan like this and execute it? Only the omniscience of God. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. 
How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out, Paul says. We have a wise God. Let's move on to the next point in the book of Romans. <coughs> Chapters 12 through chapter 15, verse 13. Paul has finished his argument in the book of Romans. He's explained Christianity. He's shown that God offers salvation to a needy world and that this salvation is something that's entirely consistent with the way he's worked with men in the past. Now he makes a break. And he says, therefore, in the first verse of chapter 12, he starts clean over, and he is doing something now that he has done but twice up to this point in the book of Romans. He is now giving instruction and commands to Christians for them to obey. He's telling us how to live the Christian life. He's explained what the Christian life is and what it involves and how it relates to God's plan. Now he says, live it. Do it right, in essence. Notice the first two verses. Let's read these two verses. I think they're the, probably the key verses to the, the whole section. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 are the key verses to this whole section. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's stop for a minute. <laughs> I was reading a, a few, and the world doesn't see that, and a lot of Christians don't see that. It's like I was listening to the radio this morning. We have an electric uh, alarm clock uh, somebody gave us, and it uh, wakes me up every time. And on Sunday mornings, I usually like to listen to it because they have uh, all this, I wouldn't call it Christian music, but it's, uh, what is it, gospel country? I th I th anyways, I usually I don't turn it off quite so quick. I lay there and listen to it. But it, it stuck out to me how opposite the world views Christianity. This morning it was evident right there, and just for a good illustration. They must have had a 15 minutes, of, you know, quite a few good, good famous songs with good messages and extolling Christ and salvation, and, you know, some good stuff there. You know? Now, as soon as the uh, the end of the time was for that, I, I forget the name of it. Somebody could probably remember the name of it. But anyways, I forget the name of the program. It, it stopped, and the next song, it was still country, was a song about the lewdness of sexual perversion and, and a man hating his wife and going out with somebody else. and You know, just like that. Now, the world thinks it's okay to profess and to act like, or to sound like a Christian, to mouth the words. God doesn't expect Christians to be like that. If that's the kind of Christianity he expected of us, we wouldn't have any more chapters in the book of Romans. You, see, you can take that right out, if that's the kind of Christianity he wants. He wants us to live like Christians. And this is how it starts. I want to draw your attention here that throughout this section, Paul shows that Christians have responsibilities to various spheres of people. First of all, to God. Primary, that's our most important responsibility, is to do, to do what God wants us to do. Then to the church. We have a responsibility to Christians as a whole. For us, it's the Christians in Gulu River. All right? To our enemies, we have responsibilities. To our government, to our neighbors, and to our, finally, to our individual brothers and sisters in the Lord. He makes it personal there. Now, we haven't got time to go all the way through this, but <clears throat> I believe that if you would read those sections and meditate on them, you would find it very clear what God expects of you as a Christian. That's one thing that's really great about the Word of God. It's clear when you read it. You read it and you can't miss what God wants you to do. In the first two verses of chapter 12, Paul gives us the instructions that God would have every Christian do. 
This is only reasonable now. He says it's your reasonable service. And it's on the background of the salvation that he's described. Since the salvation we've got is harmonious with the way God has dealt in time past, since it's a great salvation that provides victory over sin and death and defeat and suffering and trial, since we have such a great salvation, it's only reasonable that we would live pleasing to God. And that's how he starts. There, are, there is uh, one basic request in these verses. We've emphasized this before. But the request is that we're to present our whole person, present our bodies, a sacrifice to God. God wants us to be sacrificed individuals. He doesn't want Christians that are merely professors. He wants living objects. He wants me and you and everything that we've got. He wants us. Now, he wants us in a certain way. And that's what verse 2 tells us. If, we, if we're going to present, offer ourselves to the Lord, commit our lives to the Lord as a Christian, I don't say a person can't commit, this, commit themselves to God. They're still an enemy. But a Christian can. And God expects it. And if we are going to do that in obedience to his word, we've got to do it his way. Verse 2 says we're not to be like the world and we're to have a transformed mind. 100% change. See? You start to think different. You don't stay thinking the same way. And God's word is the only true guide to change our thoughts and to guide us into what is right. <clears throat> so, we're going to... I hate to just skip over that, but we're going to stop and perhaps be more profitable if we spent the time on questions. So... It's open house now. If you have questions, I want to invite anybody to ask. Okay? We've left out, uh, we haven't really gone into the third section here. This is more or less a conclusion of what Paul gives his own personal testimony. Uh, he challenges the Christians to pray for him in light of what he's doing and, and so forth. Any questions now? Maybe we should start. Any questions with chapter 118 to 321? 320. Any verses there that... Uh, no, don't be bashful. This is just like school now. <laughs> We're going to change the format here. Make it a little more informal. I think it's important. If you got a question, don't be afraid to ask. Okay? It's far better to uh, ask a question and get an answer for your ignorance than remain silent and keep ignorant. Dan. I have a question in regard to chapter 13, where it says we're to be uh, subject to rulers and that. How do you uh, reconcile that with somebody like me and you? Say I was living in Uganda. I mean, where do you uh, draw the line? Okay, good question. The question is when it says that we're to be subject under the higher powers, does that mean, you know, cross the board, blanket? You know, what does that mean? Good question. Let me answer it this way. I believe that in this section, chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, Paul is giving us some positive instruction on how we are to live before our government. Now, I'll, I'll answer your question. Uh, he doesn't give us an exhaustive summary of how a Christian is to live in relation to our, you know, our <coughs> government. Peter gives a lot more detail. He adds things that Paul leaves out. Right, uh, and Peter would give us further principles to govern our our relationship, our decisions, and so forth. <clears throat> we have many examples in the Old Testament. In fact, in Romans 15:4, this is one of the reasons why we have the Old Testament. It is written for our example and admonition. The examples there are for us to learn by, and people like Daniel, right, and people like. Well, his, his friends, they disobeyed the, the government. All right? There was reasons for it. In other words, there is there's other principles that we draw from other parts of the scripture to give us a final answer on that. Yes, I am to obey my government if at all possible. Now, what, what determines the if possible or not possible? Well, 
we, to, we are to obey our government even to the point of persecution and suffering. And we're to take that like the early Christians took it, like Jesus took it. He wasn't a social reformer. He wasn't a militant. He wasn't a revolutionary. See? But he was preaching the gospel. Now, we are to be obedient to the extent of suffering and trial, if necessary. But we draw the line when our government says you can't worship God. You can't serve God. See? The disciples in the early church said we ought to obey God rather than men. When it came right down to it, if they told me that I couldn't preach, I'd, I'd disobey the government. Not, I wouldn't uh, maybe go out in Bellevue Park and preach, you know. I might find a secluded spot and preach, all right, but I'd still preach because that's the calling that God has given to me, all right. We're to teach our children. That's what the scriptures t teach Christian parents. We're to teach our children. Now, if the government comes along and passes legislation and says you can't teach your children, you've got to send them to a day school. You can't, it's law. It's against the law for you to teach your children. There's laws like that in countries in the world then I, you disobey the law. But you do it only when they 